here to listen to that. Nice to meet you, everybody. I, uh, like I said, my name is Dean Paulson. I am uh, recently retired from the Anchorage School District, so I, I, please forgive me for being extremely nervous. I'm not used to uh, people actually listening to me when I speak. <laughs> and, uh, and feel free to get your cell phones out and talk amongst yourselves, because that's, that's what I'm used to. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a real pleasure, a honor, and extremely humbling to stand in front of Alaska Aviators, obviously, and, and speak. And so. Um, I, first thing I will disclaim is the fact that I'm sure that there are many, many aviators in here that are far surpass me in knowledge, skills, ability, and, and looks. And so I will, uh, I will tell you what I know. Um, my strong points as an instructor, I think, are probably in uh, in trying to instill some of the love of aviation that we all share, and especially towards young people. It's been a, a real blessing in my life to get to work with some fantastic young people and people of all ages. I, I've had. You know, the kid that's five years old that gets a uh, lesson for his uh, birthday and he's actually touching the controls and I've had the 85 year old dentist that I've uh, soloed for the first time and, and so it's, uh, so it's a, a myriad of uh, opportunities that I've gotten to fly with. Um, my uh, my uh, experience in Alaska came uh, right there um, with Dennis Millie and Chris Branham when I was a teenager. I got off a DC-10 over at uh, Anchorage International and walked over here and got on a Helio 295 and sat in a uh, bench seat, sling seat, with a uh, golden retriever in, uh, on one side of my leg and a uh, Millie Branham's begonias on the other side of my, my leg. And I spent the next five months with the Branhams at, uh, at their lodge. And uh, as a boy from North Dakota who had never seen the ocean or the uh, mountains before, it was quite a uh, summer, so it was a, a real indoctrination. And, uh, I remember uh, distinctly one day uh, in ninth grade being on the, what we call the meat squad in football uh, after a thorough beating by the varsity in which they would beat us up as tackling dummies every day, my beloved Outdoor Life magazine came and on the cover of it was a, uh, a picture of a open tent flap with a uh, black bear coming through the door and a 45 pointed at the head of the bear 
And, uh, and I'll never forget that story. I read it from cover to cover about uh, the Branhams and, and about Rainy Pass Lodge. And um, um, coming full circle in my life, uh, many years later, uh, flying into uh, Rainy Pass Lodge and, and meeting Bucky Winkley, the author of that story, the, uh, the cover of the story was hanging in his museum and have since become real good friends with Buckley, Bucky. And if you ever get a chance to get up to Rainy Pass Lodge, yeah, you need to stop in and see his museum and, and, uh, and get a chance to, to uh, meet those folks. But um, as uh, Carol said, and, and thank you to Carol, and, and thank you to my good friend, colleague, and former student, Aris, and, and, uh, and many of my students that I see here in the audience here. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you guys. Pleasure to stand up here in front of you. Um, like, like Carol said, um, my name is Dean Paulson. I'm a local CFI. And uh, I should have gotten on the pilot bandwagon and by now been sitting in something big and fancy with glass, but I kind of got stuck on the uh, fun stuff. So I specialized in tailwheels, floats, skis, tundra tires, off airport, that sort of thing. And, and uh, so most of my life is looking at you guys, uh, looking at the back of your head from your, from your cub. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's the enjoyment I've gotten in the last 30 years. Um, my uh, uh, teaching experience, like I said, I'd like to give a little plug for uh, my former career, which has been taken over by a phenomenal aviator, Mr. John Fick, at the uh, King Tech High School now. Um, my program met at the UAA Aviation Complex, and uh, we busted a lot of regs. Our, our class limit was 24, and I think we were close to 30 last year in our class. We stuffed them in there, and we sat on tables everywhere, and it was a fantastic program in which uh, high school seniors earned college credit and also a ground school endorsement. And uh, we even paid for their, their, grounds, or their uh, um, uh, test, their private pilot test, and uh, got them simulator time as well. So if you've got young people in aviation, juniors and seniors, um, ask me, ask Aris, ask Carol. Um, I can give you contact information, and it's a fantastic program. And again, with our, our opportunities right now, it, it certainly is, a, uh, is an amazing time to be a young person. I, I wish that I was, uh, I wish I was 25 right now, but we don't. Um, in teaching, my, my philosophy has always been really simple. I, I didn't bring a PowerPoint, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I just uh, have some simple things to say to you. And, and uh, if you disagree with them, Everything I've learned has been from watching you guys and listening to you guys and listening to people much, much smarter than myself. My good friend and, and colleague, Mr. Vern Kingsford, is here, and, and I was a little embarrassed to stand up here in front of Vern until I realized that uh, pretty much everything you're going to hear is his stolen material anyway. I stole his, his training manual from him 20 years ago, and he didn't know it, so I just I steal all of his information, and I, use, I, uh, I plagiarize his information all the time, so, I, uh, so he'll, he'll, he'll probably uh, be well-versed with most of my talking about float points. But, um, my, uh, my pyramid is based on a very simple formula in which the bottom of the pyramid is just simply safety. And, and it just has to be. I mean, we're already endeavoring into a dangerous endeavor in these small aircraft. And, and uh, as a person who trains young people all the time, high school kids and, and all the way up the food chain, I, uh, I'm always asked by the mother, you know, tell me the part about this is safer than driving to the airport. And I, I have to stop her right there. And I have to say, you know, the. The, uh, the wide body jet, the part 121 scheduled flight jet aircraft, is the second safest public transportation system in the world. The only thing that exceeds it in moving as many people safely is the moving sidewalk and the escalator. So it is an extremely safe form of public uh, transportation. Our small aircraft are not. And as much as I'd love to tell you they are, and as much as you'd like to believe they are, they are not. There's, there's a great deal of risk that is involved with that. And, and I think. Um, I think mount, like mountain climbers, we were probably drawn to that. You know, I think the, the freedom, the adventure, and the excitement are all elements that draw us into aviation. The, the romantic beauty of Alaska and the flying through rugged peaks and landing on azure blue lakes, it's, it's just something that, that no one understands unless they've had that desire and had that love of doing it. And so it's something that we are calculating and it's something that we are willing to take the, the, uh, the risk for in order to experience that. And I personally, I mean, if, if death is an option, it's going to have to stay an option because it's not something I personally can live without. Um, I have four children, a uh, 26-year-old young man who's an who's a A&P mechanic, and I have a 22-year-old young man who's just back from the uh, State Trooper Academy, and I've got a 17-year-old daughter and an 11-year-old daughter, and none of them are interested in aviation. And so it's, uh, it's uh, kind of interesting, and, and so I think it's a, it's a genetic thing that may or may not flip generations, but I, uh, I was heavy, heavily influenced by many people and, and, uh, and probably one of the greatest influences was my, was my uncle who had a, 
who had an old aircraft that uh, called a Funk. It's probably not too many people have ever seen or know about it. It was made in my hometown. Coffee Mill, Kansas. Kansas. There you go. Absolutely. Excellent. By the Funk Brothers. And, and there's Crazy. about three, um, 300 of them They're left not the entire very many world. Left, so. Very first airplane I ever flew. And, and it was interesting because a gentleman called me one day and said, I need, I need an instructor with time and type. And he said, nobody's ever heard of my airplane. I said, well, what is it? And he said, a Funk. And I said, but their first airplane I ever flew in my life was a uh, Funk, and he goes, you've got to be kidding me. So he flew around in his, in his Funk and had a, had a blast doing that. So, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, I've had some just phenomenal guest speakers come into my class, airline pilots, fighter pilots, um, um, helicopter pilots, and, and the, the one thing that everyone has in common is that thing that we all as aviators have, is that, that fear and that sense of danger of trusting your gut. And, and so that's something that I would like to instill in people, that to always trust that. If something doesn't feel right, it, it's time to, uh, to analyze what's going on. And, and one thing I've always told my students, that whether you're on tundra tires, skis, wheels, floats, it doesn't matter. Every landing is a go around with an option to land. So if things aren't working perfectly, if it's an ugly setup, if something's coming up that you just don't like, go around. And I did two of them last night. I was with a guy in a 170, and we were catching 15 to 20 knots of wind shear coming in 2.5 on Merrill last night, and it got ugly, and I said, go, 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 and, and uh, he didn't go fast enough, so I took it away, and I went around, and, and uh, I think I hurt his feelings a little bit, but his airplane's still in nice shape, so no, no bends on that, and so we, we did another try. He lost that one, too, and around we went, and finally I asked if we could button all back in and come back to seven, and, and that went pretty well, but I, I took the airplane over and landed it, and I, like I said, I, I you know, may have, may have bruised his ego a little bit, but I, I said I just, I think it would have bruised it a lot more if your airplane was banned. So we're gonna, we're gonna come back and, and address some landing issues and see if, uh, see if we can get him squared away a little bit better. Um, fear is something we're always told not to, uh, not to uh, you know, hold on to very tightly, but I've, I've always in aviation kind of considered that fear is wisdom in the face of danger. And so I, I have spent a lot of time in airplanes afraid. And, and like I said, and that's, it's not, you know, a lot of hours compared to many of you, but I, I uh, have uh, certainly uh, um, embraced that aspect of flying, that it is a dangerous endeavor. Um, float flying, as we all know, has the same potential dangers as any flying, but now we introduce two new things. We introduce hypothermia and we introduce drowning. And, and for that um, aspect of it, I would really encourage you, and, and for my students also, to never get into a float plane without wearing a PFD. I, I worked for a guy and he was just totally satisfied to have those nice little airline PFDs stuck in the back seat of a Beaver and it just wasn't the right spot. I just, I went back in and I grabbed his PFDs and I put them on everybody that was in the airplane and I showed him how to use them and I said that's where that thing goes. And he would get a little mad at me, he said I was making the people paranoid and I said I'd rather make the people alive so I, I didn't really worry about hurting the boss's feelings. I, that, uh, that, that PFD needs to be on your body because uh, because it's, it's going to get ugly. If, uh, if uh, things go wrong in a float plane, we all know that the circumstances are not very, uh, not very friendly. It, uh, uh, spend a lot of time on, uh, on egress practice and talking about the, the four points of getting out of that aircraft, the, the important element of holding onto that aircraft. You know, if you have the warning that things are going bad, hold onto that aircraft until it stops moving. Um, orient yourself in the cabin well beforehand. Close your eyes, find those door handles figure out how to regress that aircraft. You, um, people that are, are taking anyone, never assume anyone knows how to get out of the airplane, or even their seatbelt. Um, some of those problem seatbelts where we got them down against the door, uh, against the door frame and things like that, really let people know how to get out of that airplane. Um, in the, in the uh, personal flotation device, um, have some good equipment in there, have, have fire starting. If you can have a, B, a PLB in, in there, put a spot or something in a waterproof container, that's a fantastic thing, or a sat phone. Um, Multi-tool, space blanket, first aid, um, some seasonal items. Um, Ellen Paniak, I, I just love talking to Ellen every time I would see her, and uh, she said the worst crash scenario she ever had was not having head nets and bug dope. She said the very worst thing that she, she said they could have died from anaphylaxis from the amount of of bug stings that they encountered. So, so having those summer items on our survival kit, having a mosquito head net, having a good old bottle of muscle, and uh, you know, in the wintertime, having your sleeping bags, having your, your uh, uh, snowshoes, all those items that are on our survival kit, they're, they're awful important. And uh, you know, it, it says we have to have them for what? 
got to have that survival kit if you do what? If you're in a cross-country situation. If, if we're in our local area, it says we don't have to have them. But you got the right idea if you're in Alaska. Don't leave the pattern without that stuff. Have that survival gear in the aircraft. And, and in Army aviation, they said, have it on your body. And so that's why they wore the vests and had all that gear in the vest. And, and uh, the gun's not required anymore. I'm not leaving town without a gun in, in my pocket. I mean, the, you know, you see most of the guys are carrying a Glock 10 millimeter and you know, anything of that caliber, something, something suitable for, uh, for some protection out there because it's, uh, it's not, uh, not the Wild West protecting ourselves from people. There's an awful lot of stuff out there. Yeah, the learn to return for the dunker training is seventy percent. Absolutely, yeah. More chance for survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it's uh, yeah, you think you, you watch it happen. Mike, he's talking about the dunks taking. My son just got back from uh, Sitka from the Trooper Academy, and they stuck him in a cage and strapped him in and threw him in a in a swimming tank in a swimming pool, and it, it wasn't quite as easy to get out as as he thought, and and so it uh, it's a really phenomenal training, and they they come about uh, oh, it seems like every. 12, 18 months, they, they show up and they're, they're doing that kind of stuff. So that's a, that's a fantastic thing to, uh, to be aware of. Um, it, uh, specialty things, you know, the, the 206. Um, never let anybody in those back seats of a 206 without a real good, solid understanding of how to get out of there. Because that's a, that's a real tragedy in, in several cases. People that were not briefed and did not understand, you know, the, e the egress process of, of getting out of that back seat. And, and I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about with the flaps in a certain position. You know, just, just remembering that, you know, like I said, if things go bad in a float plane, you're upside down in black water, you know, and, and you got to really, you got to plan ahead. You know, the, the old saying says we don't plan to fail, but, but pl failing to plan in this situation is, is pretty darn important. So, um, uh, performance issues, <clears throat> obviously the airplane is going to take off and land longer. It's been pretty rare. I mean, I've gotten a chance to fly some awful fun stuff. I've, I've been in the Carbon Cub and, and the brand new X Cub and, and uh, you know, just about every, every flavor of Super Cub you can be in with every engine configuration. And, uh, and you can get off awful short, but still nothing's going to get at you off as short as being on a dry paved runway. So, so out there when you're in the, in the water, it's going to, you know, plan for your performance, for how much it's going to take you to get off. Um, your performance charts, you know, for your, for your aircraft were made for land, so you're going to have to take into consideration and, and, and go out and practice with that thing a lot to, to, uh, to get your distances down and figure them out. And, uh, you know, practice your techniques and, and talk to a lot of people. As I mentioned earlier, I, I, I would wear Dennis and, and Chris out with questions all the time. I was just a kid. I had begun flying, and, and, uh, and I, I was not flying yet as a, as a career. I was just a, uh, I was a camp boy. I was just a high school boy that came up and, and got to Alaska as quickly as I could and, and uh, worked as a camp boy all summer and then as a uh, packer. And, uh, and any time the helio was going somewhere and I was going in it, I'd run down to the cook tent and grab the yoke out. And so if you know Chris Branham, he's from, uh, from Africa and he uh, has kind of a funny accent and he just kind of shake his head and says, oh, you, all you want to do is fly the airplane. Every time we go someplace, you want to fly that airplane. So I, I'd, uh, I'd go bolt the uh, yoke in and he'd let me fly the helio wherever we were going. So I got quite a bit of time going back and forth building camps and sheep camps and bear camps and everything else like that. Um, Run-ups, of course, are, are on the go. I'm, I'm talking to the choir with most of you float plane pilots, but I know we got some new ones in here. And It's one of the weirdest things to get used to as you first get into float flying is everything's on the run. You're not going to stop until you hit something. and Hopefully you don't hit something unless it's the dock at a very slow speed or a, or a shoreline there. But, but run-ups have to be done on the go. Your, your control test, all that stuff has to be done on the move. Um, be terribly, terribly careful of ground personnel. Be awfully careful of dock hands and of guides that might be on, on uh, your crew and things like that. Tragic tales out there. I, I, won't, uh, I won't bring up gory details, but, but there have been a number of people killed by propellers. And it's a, uh, it's a dangerous, dangerous aspect of working around float planes because, because we're working a little closer to them and, and helping to land these aircraft. And boy, with that compression ratio on a beaver, you watch that old plop, plop plop and that thing runs a lot longer than we're used to with our Cessnas and, and so be aware of that nine foot six propeller chopping through the air because just a couple hundred RPM is going to go through a guy like a Vegematic and, and it's just really important to breed people like that. Um, working as a fly fishing guy down in Iliamna, I uh, uh, worked with one of the finest float plane pilots I've ever met in my life, Mr. Don Loshi, and, uh, and Don had over 50,000 hours and had flown everything from Bell 47 helicopters and Cubs to, to DC-10s and, and, uh, 
He, he would just absolutely wear a normally aspirated otter. I've, I've never never seen a pilot that was such an artist with it with an airplane. He could touch down so softly you didn't know you touched the ground. And, and he he said he would personally fire us if he ever saw us go forward to the strut while that prop was moving. And so we we as the guides would be out on the floats to try to catch before we hit a rocky shore down in Kodiak or, or up in Dakabak Lake or Kaiguyak Crater or wherever we're landing at the moment. And, uh, and he was the nicest guy you ever met, but he said he would make sure we were out the door if he ever saw us move forward to that strut while that prop was moving. And so, so be very careful with, uh, with people like that. And, and as we all know, you, you always get the innocent helpers. Everybody wants to come along and they're, they're intrigued by airplanes and they want to come along and help you turn the aircraft and all that good stuff. Be very, very careful with people like that. And, and even experienced aviators who don't understand the principles of, of float planes and, and some of the uh, some of the different uh, aspects that we deal with. Um, not going to really talk a lot about about all the aspects of, uh, of float flying because uh, that's going to come from your instructor. And, and as I mentioned, there's some fantastic instructors here in the state. And uh, and uh, you know, like I said, my friend Vern Kingsford down there runs a, what he calls the boot camp of float flying, so he can uh, tune you up pretty good. And, and there's a number of, of great uh, instructors here on the lake that can do that as well. But um, but the thing that I uh, have really learned over time and uh, uh, would like to share with you guys is really learning water. You know, really spend time studying water and looking at it. Look at, look at color, you know, look at that color of that water. When you see that limey green water, you know you're getting into some pretty shallow stuff. And, and uh, put on a pair of chest waders and go start walking around in the rivers and look at how long it stays shallow on the lee side of an island. And, and uh, you know, look at those outside bends, remembering that those outside bends are gonna stay nice and deep, and those insides are gonna be very, very shallow. And I, I can't give you much better advice than to spend a lot of time on water in a boat and in hip boots and just go, go uh, looking at stuff. And, and look at stuff you might not have thought about. You know, look at, look at a, a tree stuck in the Susitna River, how the big snag end is stuck upstream and that long pointy end is going downstream. If you have a question about which way the current's going, that makes it pretty obvious. So, so there are things like that that you'll notice. Um, a lot of guys like to land up river, take off down river. I, I've done them both ways, you know, circumstances and, and things like that. And, and it just, sometimes it lends itself well here and sometimes it, it lends itself, you know, better to take the, take the upwind, you know. But, uh, but you're going to have a lot of decisions to make when you start mixing mixed winds and currents in rivers and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, one of my favorite trips when I was flying for a guy here was, was to take a beaver loader rafters up to Chilatna Lake and dump them out and, and then go down and pick up the guys who dropped off three days before down at Lake Creek. And it was just a, you know, it brought in a whole new challenge was the fact you had a lot of airplanes in there. So you had to do some planning ahead to, to make sure you could, uh, you know, negotiate all those other aircraft that were going into the dock. And, um, breaks in, in, uh, in waves, you know, fly over a lake and look at those Look at those unnaturally clear spots. You see a whole lake full of waves and then all of a sudden there's a clear spot. Something's going on there. So watch out, that might be a shoal, that might be a shallow area. And, uh, and man, these, these suckers stick hard when you hit sand. I mean, you guys all know that. It's uh, not a very forgiving situation when you, when you put a float into the sand. Um, gust streaks, I always kind of tell people, look at that thing, looks like a, like a ghost. Looks like something from Harry Potter flying down the lake. You got a nice big lake, but then you got this big, gray streak moving down irregularly and, and uh, you know watch out for that dynamic wind that's going to kind of smack you at the last moment when you're not prepared and, uh, and pay attention to things like that. Uh, plants, <laughs> lilies, you know we're usually good with lilies but lilies like uh, vegetation too so you might see a nice lily field out there and they've got a big old stump they're attached to also. Um, I used to go down to Silver Salmon Lodge all the time and, and the, if you've been down into that lake not many people will land in it because it's more uh, more lilies than water. It's, it's tough to see water through the uh, through the lilies, and, and it's full of rocks, and so it's uh, it's a hazard. So so it's it's something you got to kind of negotiate and, and know about. Um, one of the one of the pilots that I met down at uh, Silver Salmon actually hit one of those rocks pretty good, and uh, introduced me to a product that that uh, is a real fantastic thing to throw in your kit, and it's just a two part putty epoxy that's a five minute epoxy with a hardener and a resin. And uh, we repaired his floats down at uh, Crosswind Lake down in Katmai using, a, uh, using this epoxy. And uh, we came back to the airplane after taking these doctors down to what look at bears and beavers sitting at an angle and I'm like, uh oh. And, uh, and so we pumped and pumped, nothing happened. 
kept coming in as fast as we could. And so I took my shirt off, got halfway in the hatch, and started forcing that stuff in. And we're able to make a field repair on that float and, and get out of there. So, so that's a good product. I, I, how many people have seen that before? It's some pretty cool stuff. I've never seen it before. Plumbing supply is where he got it. It's a plumber supply. So, um, Lily's good. Bamboo. I, I call it bamboo grass. I'm sure there's a Latin name or something for it. But you guys have all seen that funny little grass that grows in six inches of water. You pull it out. It looks just like little pieces of bamboo. You go over Twin Island Lakes. Go in between the islands of Twin Island Lake. You'll see it growing up through there. And it's usually in six inches of water. So that's the kind of stuff you watch for. Um, um, as a flight instructor, the, the number one thing that I, I start pulling out on uh, buying the flight reviews is weight and balance. And it, it's a little bit troubling as to how many people don't know how much weight they can carry or how to calculate a weight and balance. And, uh, and I, I do understand. I mean, it's, it, it's some mathematics. And, and uh, I forget who told me, but uh, Aris could probably tell you. What, what's the insult I gave you, mo your mother in class? Coast Guard called and your mother was overweight. Yes, yeah, so Coast Guard called and said your mother's overweight. So, so yeah. And, uh, so Coast Guard stands for CG. So the CG is just simply calculating all your moments divided by all, by all your weights, and that's going to give you your, your inches to uh, determine your weight and balance. And, and uh, once I say that, I get people to come up to me at a trade show 10 years later, and they'll say, uh, uh, the Coast Guard called and said, you're, and they'll, they'll recite the thing back to me. And, and so it, it's, uh, it's not a very difficult thing to do. And if anybody would like to spend a moment, I'd be happy to show you how to do a, a longhand weight and balance. You know, it's just, it's just item weight, arm, moment, and uh, take those total you know, weights and, and do the division problem and you're gonna get the, uh, the CG on there. But if you're not, if you're not gonna do that, then just simply spend, I, I'm sure you can buy dozens of them for, for under $5 or you can probably get them free. I had one that I used in class that I showed the kids called Aviation WB. Put it on your phone and it just gives you your empty weight and your CG of your aircraft and then you just start plugging in the numbers. So you put your weight in there, you put in your cargo, you put in the raft, you put all that stuff. It shows you a picture of the envelope, tells you if you're in CG range, out of CG range. You can put in how long the flight's gonna be. It'll calculate your fuel burn, show you how your CG has moved, and it's a fantastically simple program. And so if you've not seen that, I would highly encourage you to use that. It's just, it'll go on any one of your smartphones, your iPad, a lot of you guys got in the cockpits already, so it's a very, very simple device and, and, uh, and really cheap, really, really cheap. Um, Get, get a good understanding of the center of buoyancy. Have your instructors spend a good deal of time getting you to understand what's meant by that center of buoyancy and how it affects the aircraft when you're doing different things. Why, why does the aircraft do this when we put it into a plow? What happens to that center of buoyancy when we, when we enter the plow phase? And, and what, what exactly is going on? And, and again, these are, these are not things that I'll spend a lot of time talking about, but things that your instructor can tell you about and, and, uh, and, and really explain thoroughly to you. Um, the big hazards, obviously, the downwind turn. You know, that, that's, we, we all know the danger of that, of, of making that turn with both inertia and, uh, and with centrifugal force and, and the wind as a factor. That's a, obviously a, a recipe for disaster. And, and uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that the float plane is, is subject to those same aerodynamic principles that make the wing fly. You know, coefficient of lift equals one half row times velocity direct, uh, uh, velocity squared. And so when we look at the dynamic principles of the float, we've got the same thing happening. As we start doubling the speed on the water, we're seeing not a doubling of the dynamic pressure on the bottom of the float, but four times the energy on the bottom of that float. So we are lifting higher out of the water. You know, as we let go of that rope on the water skis, we sink down because that dynamic pressure is diminishing. And so, uh, you know, even though it feels dangerous going around the outside of that corner, it's often better to be a little faster than a little slower. Because getting, getting slow is when we start losing that energy where we can start digging in that float and, and having some, some energy issues there. Um, obviously, big waves are the things that we seem to be most worried about. I, I've had very few situations with big water that, I, that has given me too much problem. But, um, but if you drive around Lake Hood and, and start looking at airplanes, especially from a distance, you'll see an awful lot of 206s with some pretty good wrinkling on that aft fitting. And you can tell those, those airplanes have been clobbered pretty good into some big water because uh, you know, there's no shock absorption on these floats. And so it's driving it right up into our fuselage. And, and so do, do baby those airplanes. I mean, that, 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 uh, that uh, short water technique, that, uh, that rough water technique is extremely important when we get into those big waves to diminish that energy of pounding right into our fuselages like that. So um, 
Glassy water, of course, is the, the real danger. It's, uh, it's uh, got some, some real, uh, real dangers to it. Um, Glenn Allsworth told me years ago to uh, not ever wear polarized glasses in float climb. And I thought, really, what? It seems like it'd give me better visibility. He said, polarized glasses, I can see right through the surface of the water and I see the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the stream or the, uh, or the lake. And so it throws off my depth perception. I said, I never really thought about that. So um, again, some great, great uh, uh, knowledge. That all the way, I have breakfast every <coughs> Thursday morning with John Allsworth and a couple Lake Clark people, and, and I just like to shut my mouth and listen to the to the wealth of information that came from from just incredible resources in aviation. Babe was just inducted into the uh, uh, Airman's Hall of Fame. So um, this one we'll, we'll save for the end here, but. Uh, Getting forward up on the floats on a, on a touchdown, this, uh, this mother load video is, is a, uh, probably the most spectacular video that's ever been captured because it's in full uh, Technicolor. It was done for a movie back in the uh, Vern 60s, 70s, the mother load, yeah. And so uh, beautiful, beautiful beaver that gets into some big trouble trying to simulate an accident that turns into a real accident. Um, <laughs> use of your uh, checklist, the, uh, the cars checklist, I, I, I've modified it a little bit, you can call it ACF cars, you can have all kinds of stuff in there if you're flying auxiliary fuel pumps and cowl flaps and everything else, but I put an F in the front of it for flaps. So if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I you know, identify the proper flap setting for takeoff or landing. Uh, carburetor heat, area clear, water rudders in the proper setting, radio call, stick back, stick in the proper place. Uh, Pre-flighting is obviously harder. Uh, guy I worked for did not pre-flight. I never saw him do a, a fuel sample one time. On, on the aircraft that we were flying, and so it's a, uh, it's, it's harder to do. I mean, you might have to get a, get wet, but it, but it's terribly important to make sure that you are, uh, that you're pre-flighting these aircraft in a safe manner. Make sure, I and mean, they're, they're a recipe for getting water and, and condensation. And so, uh, Lake Hood is, is a magnet. I, I pulled as much as a, a quart of water out of a, a, a strainer one day, just doing test after test after test. And first one, the student was just about ready to throw it, and I said, stop. And I took it and I smelled it and I said, what's that smell like? He said, I don't smell anything. I said, I don't either. I said, that's all water. So, uh, so <laughs> make sure you're checking for that stuff. Uh, from, a, from a flying standpoint, you know, the aircraft's not terribly different. There's a few different things. Um, when I heard about the tail stall, I, I went looking for it when I was younger and I tried to stall, you know, a 172 with full flaps and a forward slip and all that stuff. And I tried to try and try for years. I, I never had it happen until I was on floats. I was flying with a uh, guy in a 172 XP one day, and we stalled the daylights out of that tail. And, and if you understand the basic aerodynamics, the, the wing is flying up, but the tail's flying down. So the tail stopped doing its its uh, job, and it was it was dramatic. I don't know if you've ever been in one of these, but it was a it was an instant loss of 500 feet. And so we we did it at 2,500 feet, and it was it was really dramatic. So um, read up on the on the recovery technique. It's not the same as a as a normal stall technique, it's neutralizing and and, uh, and it's a kind of a strange technique to recover from, but it's a it's a it is a bizarre encounter, and I do believe it probably was from the floats. I think we did wash the tail out a little bit with the floats, and, and that's what caused it. So so it was something that uh, well, I did it once. I don't think I'm uh, inclined to do it again. It was fairly uh, fairly terrifying. I don't think I'll go looking for trouble again. Forward slips in a slip, in a float plane. Um, You've got much more fuselage hanging out there. You've got another, almost a whole fuselage hanging out there. So you've got some much more authority in a forward slip. So you'll notice the airplane's going to come down much more. Take a take a little BC-12 or a Champ or a, or a 70 CA and, and uh, get some pretty amazing descent rates out of them getting a, getting a forward slip in there. So it's a it's a whole new airplane with that with that with those floats hanging on the side. And uh, Carol, am I doing okay on time? Am I going over? Uh, you're good. Okay, okay. Stop me if you if you had enough, just give me the hook. Just push me. <laughs> so. Well, maybe, uh, maybe five more minutes and then some questions for five or ten. Perfect, perfect. Okay. I, I always told my teenage boys that, you know, when you're talking to teenage boys, they fantasize about every five minutes while you're talking. And so I, I didn't want to give them that much pleasure. So I would usually put it up. I'll try to break this down a little bit. Um, you know, the big problems in Alaska we see people, our, our number one killer is obviously still control flight into terrain, and that's, that's in any aircraft, but in, in float planes especially, we, we tend to get overweight. Um, I see pre-flighting as an issue, people getting lazy on pre-flighting. Um, fuel concerns, you know, it can be hard to find a seaplane base that has fuel on it, so you might have to think about caching your fuel and, 
and, uh, and uh, having fuel accessible to you. Uh, remember, we can't land everywhere. I, I've had a number of friends who've gotten into trouble landing in different places that are off limits. I mean, don't, don't go stick an airplane into Kootenai Lake unless you want to make some real enemies real fast. Um, buzzing people, you know, it, it's, everybody would agree it's a thrilling thing that would probably be fun to do, and it's resulted in some real tragedies. So, so we've, we've probably seen some of the stuff where, you know, uh, we, people have been hit on the surface by, by someone thinking it would be kind of fun to buzz them. Remember our, our basic FARs, that you know, closer to uh, people, vessels, structures than 500 feet, except for the express purpose of takeoff and landing. Um, survival gear on all flights. Um, question, the kids always challenged me to take the test and I got a question wrong. Can you move a uh, aircraft wreck after a wreck? Yeah, you can. And, and that's, and then especially like a float plane, you're probably not gonna have an airplane if you don't move it. So. So come along in the airplane is an awful good thing to have. It is, it is legal by the FARs to move a wreck. So, um, when I first started flying Wake Hood, the very first thing I did, the very first person I talked to when I was a young man was Tom Wardley, and a lot of people know that name. So I, I went right to Tom, and I just asked him every question about Lake Hood, because it seemed complicated. And I just really, really thought I could get into some trouble and step on some toes and get into some bad airspace really quickly. And so, uh, so talk to people about all these different routes. Uh, your Alaska supplement, everybody knows, has all the routes in and out of here. And um, if, you, uh, if you want to talk to some awfully friendly people, just pull up 119 or 4 and talk to, uh, talk to clearance delivery. I mean, they, they talk to you like a regular person. You can ask them questions. They're not really like talking to towers. So if you don't understand the tank farm arrival very well, ask them questions. They're, they're wonderful about doing it. And, and also, they're recorded doing that stuff. So remember, if you made the effort to go asking some questions and, and trying to solve some problems and later on have some trouble and they didn't help you out. I mean, there, there's some onus that's put on some other parties there. So, so think about that. Um, Lake Hood is, is complicated. So, so you know, like I said, spend some time here. Talk to people who have been doing it right for a long time. Talk to the carriers. Uh, you know, it just uh, it is some incredible people over here that, uh, that uh, will really help you out. Very top of the pyramid I talk about is fun. I don't have to talk about that much. That's why we're all here. I mean, it's just the, the fun aspect of flying. I, I, if, if you're not excited about, about flying floats, I don't know what kind of person you are. I just, there's gotta be something mentally wrong with you. If you mix an airplane with a, with a, seat, with a, a boat and, and go out, it, it just never gets old. Um, uh, good old Orrin Hudson, my, my friend Jim Moriarty buddies, uh, widget from him last year and so we went out to uh, Whitefish and all the way to Sparavon trying to find some car caribou and I could have carried less. I, I was sitting in Orrin Hudson's widget and, and I was just in, on cloud nine. I mean it just, you know, we didn't see any caribou so we flew down to Lake Clark, landed in Hardenburg Bay, had a burger and, and just flew around. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And we didn't see a caribou for 700 miles and I couldn't have had a better time. And so it, it's just, the fun aspect of flying doesn't have to be explained much but, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's why we're here. Um, the, the most tragic thing that I see is people going out in the endeavor of having fun and hurting themselves. And that, that's always a terrible thing. You, you hear about the guy that, you know, just went to Hawaii, tried out boogie board and broke his neck and he's a paraplegic, you know. And, and, and we've all seen, you know, people that go out, trust their pilot, they jump in an airplane, they go off and they, they don't come back. You know, they're, they're down, in the, down in the woods in southeast or they're, they're stuck someplace. And, and so, you know, the, the more time we spend on that, on that safety side, you know, will increase the fun part of it. Um, uh, big thing I want to, the very last thing I want to talk to you guys about is the fact that, you know, we are flying to have fun, but that fun needs to stop when there's other people in the airplane. You, you no longer get to have fun. You are the pilot in command, and your position is as important as if you are flying a, a, a 777 heading for, for uh, Paris. You, you are on your instruments, you are on your flight plan, you are flying the aircraft, you're monitoring, you can point some stuff out, everything else like that, but you don't let your guard down for a moment. Those people can be plastic, they can be shooting pictures all they want, but it is your job to get them to their destination safely. Um, good friend of mine says, he says, I care less about the people in the back, I'm gonna get home safely. So it's, that's not a bad, uh, not a bad idea either. It's pretty hard to bring the people back harmed if you, if you didn't harm, harm yourself. Um, let your people know, on your, on your briefings especially, make sure you make them aware of those aviation days. I tell people that, you know, for most of my flight lessons, you're within cell phone range. I mean, they just they kind of forget little things like that. 
point out where is your ELT. Do you have any perb in the uh, in the aircraft? You know, do you have fire starting stuff? Do you have everything? Point out every every bit of your survival gear. Tell them where it's at. Um, your environmental dangers. I do not let anybody in the airplane with flip flops and shorts. In the winter time, they're dressed to walk and spend the night. Um, don't let people into your aircraft that are not dressed properly for it. Uh, rain gear in the summer. I don't care if the sun's shining. They need to have some place, some way to stay dry. Um, the old old three three rule. You know, we we can read, we can. Uh, we can last three seconds without hope. We can last uh, three minutes without oxygen. We can last three, uh, what is it, three hours without shelter, three days without water, three uh, weeks without food. But, um, but you know, that shelter is pretty important. You gotta have, gotta have a good rain jacket to stay out there. Um, animals, you know, we got some awfully dangerous animals up here, so you gotta be aware of that. As a, as a young guy working in Katmai, we're working within brush distance from bears. I mean, we have, we have bears everywhere you go moose, all kinds of things. Tourists are some of the dumbest creatures you'll ever deal with. So, so when, when you get these people in your airplane, you got your, your uncle up from Kansas. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, do not, do not calculate on them having any brains. They will walk <laughs> right up to an animal and they'll do whatever. I had a guy from Czech Republic that just walked right up to a bear down the Moraine Creek and just started clicking pictures and I just carefully grabbed them and walked them away and told them not to look the bear in the eye and just to carefully walk with me. And so, so it's a, it's a, always a little bit astonishing. Um, very last thing I'll say is, is in, in my 35 years of flying, I've broken aviation into just two elements. And, and the two elements that I would really stress that you, that you identify in your flying are energy management and situational awareness. If you, if you break everything that we do into just a simple, simple strategy, you'll find that to fly safely and fly well, you've got to fly the aircraft correctly. There's an amount of energy, there's an amount of speed, there's an angle of attack, there's a pitch angle, there's a bank angle for every aspect of flight. And if you are, are not doing it correctly, it's going to bite you. I mean, you, you might have gotten away with it before. You might have said, you know, I, I stalled the airplane and recovered with ailerons, but, but you do it again and, and you might be in a spin really quick. Um, situational awareness is just simply saying that for every situation, there is a potential danger, whether it's Walking on the dump, a good friend of ours broke her arm walking on a pair of Edo 2000s. Not, not the best float for walking on. You know, she, uh, her husband actually sold them and got a pair of Baumans. And, and those Baumans are like walking on a sidewalk and she just loved those floats. But she broke her arm and had to have surgery because she fell off the floats. Situational awareness, making someone aware of how dangerous that is. Snagging your feet in the turnbuckle around your water rudders. Um, you know, just, just being aware of all the potential dangers that are in, in, involved in flying. Beautiful sunny day, what's one of our biggest dangers on a beautiful sunny day? Mid-air collisions, planes, yeah. And boy, I'm telling you what, from an instructor side, the more glass I'm seeing in your airplanes, the more time you're spending looking at it. Get your head outside and look for airplanes. Keep your head on a swivel, and you should be spending 85% of your time looking for airplanes and a quick glance inside every once in a while. That ADSB is wonderful stuff, but it doesn't catch my guy with the wood prop that starts it with an Armstrong starter. He's got no mode C, he's not gonna show up there. <laughs> so, so, you know, don't rely on technology to keep you out of trouble, so. Like I said, I, I, I'm humbled to be in front of you. I don't know if too much of that was, uh, was interesting. I didn't see anybody nod off, so it must've been not too bad. But, uh, but like I said, there's a lot more information that you guys can glean from a lot more professional sources than myself. And uh, the only thing I would encourage you to do, pre-flight pre your airplanes well, plan. Don't be afraid to be a chicken, turn around. And that's that's the first thing I would tell you, and uh, and trust your instincts. So, thank you guys very much. It's been a real pleasure meeting you all. Open up for a few questions. Do you have any questions for Dean? Sir, got three. Two of them are website stuff. <laughs> Since you plagiarized all the first stuff, does he have a website? <laughs> um, Absolutely. He's all over the web. I don't know if it's good. Some of this that you were kind of reading off of, do you have something you prefer to go to? I mean, I, you can look at the state law, the medical stuff. But I, I, just I, the technique of yeah, I carry I carry the stuff that is is listed, you know, in the supplement. And so so I carry that. Um, uh, the other, I carry gun. That's not listed. It's not required anymore. But I do always carry a gun. And, and uh, um, well, I mean, those are the manuals. Right, right. Extra stuff. Extra stuff. Um, 
You know, I, I carry, uh, I got two SOG tools. I've got two multi-tools that I keep with me, you know, because that, that's a real critical thing to have a good tool. Um, you know, some basic uh, toolkit also. Um, have, have basic repair items. Have, have Gorilla Tape and wire and, and uh, channel. channel locks and, and you know, vice grips and, and you know, just about, like Clint Eastwood said, if you can't fix it with, uh, with one of the vice grips and uh, WD-40, it's not broken. You know, so. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, just, uh, you know, the more stuff you can, you can have in the aircraft, you know, within reason, where you don't get too crazy on the weight and stuff like that. My, the, the Army's philosophy of having a survival vest, that was to survive. What you have in the back is to be comfortable. Yeah. Uh, BLM lost a plane up by Cochineau. Their vacuum pack <coughs> survival gear was in the back of the plane, upside down in the water, and they were all standing in shore, mm -hmm. and nobody would go back and get it. <laughs> nobody. Yeah. And nobody had a vest with fire starter or anything else. Oh. Yeah, one of, one of my favorite books when I was a, a young teenage boy was The Hatchet, Gary Paulson's The Hatchet, and, and of course that survival kit was in the airplane in the bottom of the lake, so. <laughs> Didn't do him any good until he swam down and got it at the end of the summer there, so. <laughs> you say where would you're gonna crash in? Exactly, yeah. You had mentioned where to be turned up front there. They actually have their classes every couple months, about every two months. Every two months now. How do you find that? They just go to learn every turn website. Okay. is about float planes and water, but I, I don't think I've ever dropped a cell phone out of my pocket in my life. Not yet. <laughs> on land. On land. On land. But you get around a float plane and out it goes. And I'm, one moment I'm taking a leak off the back of a, a pair of floats and the next moment I'm looking at my phone going down to the bottom of the twin lights. And so it's just that it's an odd thing. I, I stripped down my underwear right over here and swam in after my niece's cell phone. <laughs> and I've got a, another customer's cell phone. I don't know what it is with cell phones. Highly encourage you, before you get out, make sure all those pockets are zipped up because, man, that lake likes your loose items. It's crazy. It's crazy. Do you recommend not having self-inflating life vests that um, are water activated? You know, I, I've never used one. I've just got an old school Stearns. And, and you know, the, the idea is, of course, to clear the aircraft before you inflate it. So that would be my only issue. I, I'm not an expert on that, so I don't know what the, mm -hmm. what I would suggest on that. But they do get pretty big. They, they, you know, it might make getting out an aircraft a little bit harder. So, After you get out. Yeah. yeah. Sir? What's your thought on helmets? Oh, fantastic. I mean, that's a, you know, 80% of our, our, our deaths are coming from head injuries. So I had a HG-51. Air Force helmet that I wore for years, and, and I and it was pretty cool. I bought the civilian plug for it, and everything, and then I bought a dog on pair of those Bose A twos, and then I could never stand not wearing them again. So, so I need to figure out a helmet that'll fit those. Mesa has it. Mesa's got one now that has it. Okay. Okay. Are the lights carrying it yet? Or? Okay. Okay. I'm sure it's cheap. It's probably yeah. two thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you touch on some of the basics of rough water takeoff techniques? Uh, rough water takeoff techniques is, you know, you're, you're keeping the bows up, so you're taking off. I, I personally use full flaps. I, I like to full, uh, use full flaps, and it, this is where I don't want you to quote me, because I've spent a lot of time playing with these techniques, and uh, took a 180 out one day, and just set a marker on the shore, and I went full power and full flaps, all right? And as the aircraft started to transition onto step, I let the flaps come to zero. And I put the flaps all the way to zero, and then at rotation, pulled them all the way to 40 again. And, uh, and I could not ever get the airplane to come off as short as that. Um, with rough water techniques, I go full flaps in almost every airplane I fly. Not, not a beaver full flaps, but because you're... It's always a move. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but on a Cub, on a 180, 185, I apply full flaps, keep my hand on, keep my, my thumb on the button, and as we come off, it's about a five second count. 
and, and it's that weird LD curve maps where you're where you're changing that angle of attack off the flaps. You know, you're producing more and more lift as you approach that 20, getting rid of that drag, and it's it, it's that 20 mark, and then it's about five seconds, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, and as you come off the water. And, and again, that's something I've experienced experimented with quite a bit. But um, but I I guess from what I would teach you is just full flaps, you know, dead into the wind, and then way back on the heels, and you're full power, obviously, and as the airplane starts to, you know, get into ground effect, you're gonna, biggest thing is to maintain that positive rate of climb, and do not recontact those waves under any circumstance. You've gotta keep climbing. Doesn't have to be the greatest rate of climb, but make sure you do not come back and hit a wave. So, so don't be stupid heavy. Uh, yeah, it's, you know. <laughs> yeah. The other thing, if you come back to the leg curve, you can land in Lake Sonard with over 15 knots of wind. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had people come in that said, hey, I can't do the normal yeah. landing. And you're the pilot command, tell them what you want to do and mm -hmm. land how you want to land. No Lake Hood's not that weird until you look at that South Lake Sonard. That's a little weird. I, I haven't done it too many times. If you want expert advice on that, talk to Allison. I mean, he's, he does it 15 times a day. And he stays on step and comes peeling around there and goes right back to his dock again. The uh, people in the condos must love it. <laughs> I could say it's uh, uh, Lake, Lake Hood obviously has opened up some really great opportunities. I was I was telling Carol it was one of those moments where uh, where the women women all just you know politely nodded, but the men were in tears. I, I conducted a wedding for my brother-in-law over at the uh, at the museum here, and I was telling how in 1941 Lake Hood and Lake Spinard were joined by a uh, by a canal, and they dredged it out, and and the uh, the two became greater than one and served a greater purpose. And and I, and I looked out, and the men were all just. <laughs> <laughs> and the women are like, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, Lake, Lake Hood offers us some, some wonderful opportunities for for dealing with some pretty difficult wind situations. So, so that uh, take advantage of you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Has everybody seen this? I think everybody's seen this. It's uh, it's about as wrong as it can go. Well, it was intended to be a crash, but got to be a much worse crash. Yeah. The pilot died. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's sad, but there's a lot to be learned from it. So I would just say after we do this, um, play this video, and you can talk amongst yourselves. Ask. I see a lot of people in here of a wide variety of ages. So if you have a gray hair near you, it's a great opportunity to learn from them. Ask them, why did this airplane crash? See what you can learn. But don't get involved in a long conversation, because as soon as we get the other speaker hooked into the system, we're going to get going again in about five minutes.
Yeah, it was freaking crazy.
Our next speaker arrived from the North Slope just a few minutes ago. This is Steve Jones. He's getting his uh, presentation set up here. I'll just give you a quick introduction of Steve. It's, um, he is one of the most multifaceted pilots I know, and I've been privileged to fly with Steve on several occasions, several different jobs that we both had simultaneously. And uh, I think the last time we flew together was a super exotic tour of Northwest Alaska. Yeah, that was the most fun trip Yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, so. Two motor turbine all over Alaska. All expenses paid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The finest hotels. Oh, that would be tough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, Steve's going to talk to us tonight about low plane destinations and activities. And uh, I know that all of you have ideas of what people do with low planes. This is just a few things uh, that might interest you, or maybe we'll all learn something new. I'm betting. Steve is the owner of Sunlight Aviation, uh, in addition to his many other jobs as a contractor for multiple different companies. Um, he has a Cessna 1E on floats, and uh, that's Sunlight Aviation, and he only flies in the sun in the summer, that's which right. is thus the name. It was a marketing decision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he also flies multiple airframes and stays current in all sorts of fun airplanes flying locally here in Alaska. So with that, please welcome Steve. Thanks, girl. Great place. <laughs> I get to come to the New Airman's building, which is fantastic. That, uh, that movie was now I'm going to finish. That's uh, how Jonesy screwed up. And I'll uh, maybe throw in some suggestions. This is where I was about two hours ago, and that's a quarter mile visibility <laughs> at the park. I'm sure it was half. RVR was <laughs> We landed when it was 1,400 and uh, I got a video of a taking off. Uh, can you do this? That one right there. <laughs> that? No, this is Piper. Look that one. There you go. This is Jones. <laughs> I'm the loadmaster. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> 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 I'm a kick ass loadmaster. Loadmaster autopilot. <laughs> well, Steve and I were joking that, okay, we fly a lot of airplanes. Don't be alarmed. Just that we, you know, aren't as confident with some technologies. <laughs> So yeah, I got uh, Sunlight Aviation, or air taxi business I started uh, about 12 years ago, because I inherited a 180 from my dad, and realized the first year I couldn't afford to fly it. <laughs> I started a business to afford it. And uh, in order to afford that business, I'm also flying for Conoco in the winter, the contract. <laughs> it's a good gig, I can keep it up. All right, how do I full screen this guy? Go up to a few. So uh, Carol gave me an idea of uh, what to go with on this guy. And uh, I like the destinations idea. When I first started flying floats, I thought it was for just a bunch of rich idiots. You know, a boat problem with an airplane problem. It's slow, it's heavy, picks up ice, you can't carry a lot of payload. And then I went uh, on one of my first trips, I got a float plane uh, Rating and you know, I thought it was kind of fun. And then uh, married my wife, and her dad had a 185, and started going everywhere in the state with it. And finally, I was like, hey, I gotta have this. I'll never forget that uh, I was on a trip in LA one time, and uh, Piper called me and she said, We, we gotta buy the clothes for the plane. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you gotta tell me once. So, anyway, once you get a float plane, the next thing is, you know, obviously the annual, 20,000 bucks is the first annual you get, and then it goes down from there. And then you start flying around, and uh, the next problem you have is where to go, destinations. So I figured out after the couple of years that uh, these public use cabins are a great destination. You know, they've all got cabins, they've all got good emergency shelters. They're uh, usually good beaches. You've got a boat you can use. They're on lakes. I mean, all of them are on lakes. And uh, you know they're already tried and true. They're evolved. There's no big rocks there you're going to worry about. Big logs in the way. You're not landing on somebody else's hunting ground or something. And every time I've landed at one of them, if I'm not uh, reserved, you know, if I haven't uh, set up a, a, a cabin to stay at, usually if somebody's there, they're really friendly, they'd love to see someone there. Usually nobody's there, even if it's reserved, I'll go in there. So the McLean Lake down here in the P9. Well, it is reserved a lot, but there's never anybody there. So anyway, it's good practice. Put fuel in the plane, go out, Cog Hill, McLean Lake, 
paradise or something. And I got some more pictures. I want to bring this up because uh, one of the main reasons we go flying is for friendship. This is Million Dollar Beach on the Nushigak River. And when I first started going there, there were, I'd see 10 planes. You'd get in the boat and you'd take a picture of 10 airplanes there, so it was Million Dollar Beach. Now Fritz Reinbold has his beaver there, so we're about four airplanes, and it's still Million Dollar Beach. <laughs> This is um, Beluga Lake, always a great uh, easy destination, you can catch fish over there, that's on Cold Creek. One thing I've noticed is a problem with the Beluga Lake, and, and everybody, you guys have probably already figured this out, every year it floods, every spring it floods. Hmm. This was a nice year, but last year I was out there and there were some huge trees in that river slew there, there was a big split in the channel, so it's hard to get in close to have a nice beach and a nice lunch. Fishing. Mm -hmm. Another, the, the main reason we go find. This is on the Nushikak River and it's on a gravel bar. These are all silvers. I think we were there in August. And the one thing I learned, you can see I'm on a gravel bar. Dave, my buddy, I'm all flying for a lodge here. He's on a gravel bar and this way you avoid all the land claim issues, the native land claim. If you're on a gravel bar, you know, it's public land. So the Nushikak River is full of fish and gravel bars and uh, what I learned, you know, that was a brilliant moment. You land on the nice long stretch, park on a gravel bar, and you're, you're safe. You guys go up and down the river on boats and they just wave at you. Mm -hmm. Those are all the kings we caught one day in the Noosh, early mm -hmm. August, early July. My daughter, trying to get her interested in So this picture, he didn't tell us we were going anywhere. Jump in. Muck boots, and then we had, in order to fish, we had to uh, take our shoes off and wear pants off. My daughter's first paint was her pink fly rod, pink fly, and she's a barefoot. She's into it. <laughs> a little bit chilly. Yeah. So this is a paradise lake. We went in the fall, and like I say, no plans, no nothing, just to head south. And you know, paradise lake is a nice little trip. You go down the, the railroad and you hop over the pass there. Nice beach. There's the kids getting out. There's a the cabin back there. If you guys haven't been to Paradise Lake, that's why I want to show it. Typical public use cabin. They got uh, tables, they got a stove. As Dean alluded to, you've always got a shelter in case something happens. Especially a broken starter drive. Something like that. That's the view. And uh, one of the other things, if you want to catch some fish, you know, all the log books are filled in by the guests and they'll tell you where the fish are if you read them enough. So this is a trail through the little pass there, and so there's our fish back there. That's me, heavy catching fish. And that's the takeoff run. It's just the scenery. It's always pretty well up. That's my place. After I went to all these other places enough, I had to pony up the money and build my own place. That's our floating dock, which is a floating house for water. So that's an early on the lake on the... Uh, on the east side of Ileana Lake, kind of by um, oh, Rainbow Lodges and uh, Intricate Bay and Kuzak Lodges there. And the place is really cheap and it was on the market for a long time and all my lots next to me are still for sale, so I was asking somebody why and they said, well, you know, it blows 100 knots in there <laughs> two or three times a year. <laughs> so far my place is still standing. Those trees are protecting it. I won't cut those trees down. They're basically saving my place. And then this is up at uh, Lake George. A lot of people are warning me away from, you know, landing in the glaciers because, you know, you never know how big they are below, but really it's a nice place and you usually got a good wind. And you can tuck in here, beach up, heel up on the beach and then climb. It's great climbing the rocks. A lot of quartz up there. I told my kids there's gold in that quartz. Up there. Anything you get them interested. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, Copper Lake, Cooper Lake, Copper Lake down in the Kenai. If I, uh, Anyway, up in the pass there, a little, little water. I tried to get some fish, but there's nothing there. Anyway, nice lake to land on. Like Dean says, it's just fun for us to land and find a place, you know, challenge yourself. The fish are for the uh, passengers who are sitting back there bored. I caught, I had some uh, clients about five years ago, no more than that, during the big housing crisis, 08 or 09. 
and uh, the big mortgage meltdown. They were bankers in Atlanta, and they wanted to come up here and get away from everybody. <laughs> and they come up and camp out, and I was like, well, I got twin legs, you know, people come through there, Tlaquana, Turquoise, but there's always hikers going through there, and they go, no, they want to get dropped off somewhere, nobody around, and I was climbing that a little for security air, and I went through the pass and got to two legs here. Thought that was a pretty good idea, so I kind of looked at it, and uh, nobody goes in there except unless you have, if you have a cabin. So anyway, I thought it was a great place, and they brought him in. I dropped him right there in that point, which was protected when I landed. I think there was no wind, but when I took off, it was really howling out of the, uh, the west, southwest. So, you know, land here, come around the corner, load up, come back out, and then you can blast off. Go for technique, but anyway, nice to find a place like that, away from everyone. And this is a calm day right in the middle of uh, Ilyanda Lake. Nobody lands in the middle of Ilyanda Lake. On a calm day, those flying with the lodge, and that's Dave, he's already there. This is his little point, his little secret point. Everybody was tired of fishing and didn't want to go hiking, so we brought the shotguns out and did some trap shooting. And I, mean, I just wanted to show Lily on the lake when it was super calm. They had the PBY in there easy. That's us on the beach. I don't know if I any shot, shots of the shooting trap. Nope. Hey, tides. <laughs> Recently, like lakes over rivers, one of them is uh, tides. This is on the Naknek. This is our place on the Naknek that had a super minus tide. It happened overnight, I think by 4 a.m. it was down like that. So we were high and dry. Luckily, I was on the mud, and uh, we went out and marked all the rocks while we were there. But my father-in-law wasn't so lucky. He ended up on one of the boot, one of the tie downs. Just locked up like that, and you know, nothing to do. We made it until the tide came back in. So anyway, I watch the tide books now all the time. So Nick Nick has a tide time. But, uh, oh, that's a different one. But uh, I still don't know the technique for time, timing the tide for like uh, Montague Island or uh, you know, Switch Shack, some of these places. Like I should take Kodiak, add a couple hours, subtract a couple hours, trial and error. Anything probably yeah. knows, yeah? There's yeah. an app for that. There's an app for that. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Now I know. <laughs> okay, this is Kodiak, a Fognac Island. That's my brother in law. and. Uh, Parked there, they went hunting for elk up around the corner, up over the hill, came back right at dusk, and as he's walking down the trail, he noticed, figured something was wrong, but was too tired to do anything about it. Went into the tent, and then the next morning, this is what he found. You know, and as you know in Kodiak, when the wind can uh, blow you know, 20 or 30 at altitude, it really funnels in between those hills, and it creates those tornadoes, mini tornadoes, and that's what happened here. I don't know how he's parked, he's a conscientious guy, he had both wings tied down, obviously, but must have got the plane spun around and got the you know, wind under the tail and just flipped it over and it came out. Floats up, plane down. And then we uh, hooked a couple ropes to the tail and muscled it over, flipped it over. And the interesting thing for me was uh, they took the floats out of that, swung the wreck back to Kodiak on a jet ranger. Put it on a barge, barged it to Homer, and then drove it up the Alcan to Wust to a Wasilla, and he's still flying it. Yeah. Stood up good. Had to replace the motor, but the GPS, the Garmin 296, was still good. <laughs> <laughs> I was a big believer in the Garmin. So. so anyway, this brings up a point. I've never had to do it, but if you got to spend the night in Kodiak, I was talking to a guy. How do you do it? You sink the floats. Okay, thanks. My idea was to bring two five-gallon buckets, stick them in your floats. And then, like I say, try to, I guess, point someone in the prevailing wind that you think is going to be, sink the floats, and then the guy I talked to has said also you can tie the five-gallon buckets to the wing tie downs and sink those, hmm. and that's going to keep it right. It takes another hour to dump it out when you're ready to go. It's a lot easier and a lot of fun. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to throw that out as a discussion, but that's the only way I know about staying overnight. I always drop people off. Come back home. <laughs> Helped some guys off at uh, Surprise Glacier last year. And uh, when I picked him up, he said, you know, you got to come and get us. It's going to get stormy tomorrow. I picked him up. There was a guide and his hunter, and they had built a rock wall around their camp about this high. So I get out of there. Oh, yeah, just a low cloud ceiling. It's not true. 
problem with the flow plane is you can't outfind hardly anything. So it's going to be unless the help of experts and uh, materially involved. <laughs> and, uh, this is how you uh, save a little room in the cabin. Makes the cabin a little quieter. My son was begging to fly to ride in that. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get you on plane. Yeah, this is going to uh, Montague, and this is uh, one of the deals when I got into a problem with the tide. My buddy was coming out on wheels, and I was coming out on floats, and this is at uh, Peach River. So he wanted low tide to land on the beach, and he was still a little leery about it. I didn't know why until I saw these wings sitting on the beach. <laughs> this guy landed there, and I guess there's some under, you know, the sand can be smooth, but there's uh, washouts underneath, and this guy flipped over at 182, and I guess he couldn't get out of there, and it filled up with sand. The, Wings filled up with sand on the next high tide, and it was done. Went up to the fuselage. Kids making sand uh, images. So that's me on the beach, right over the hump. And you can see how the tide is way out. And right up here, I'm trying to take off that way, but right up there is where the gravel bar is buried off. And it's getting dark. There's my buddy in his 180 on wheels. He's like, well, that's great, I'm out of here. <laughs> Cross, yeah. Uh, so anyway, we got home. That's a, that's after we landed. We got home, landed in Lake Hood in the, almost in the dark. My first time ever. And I actually had to step over those rocks. They unloaded everybody. I stepped over that gravel bar because I didn't count the. Uh, I was looking at the sewer tide tables, and you know I had two hours or something. Still wasn't right. It was 6 p.m. Water's still going out. So I stepped over those, that little rock bar and then turned around and came back, and I had to actually step around the corner and get out into the ocean a little bit. Swells, but it's a pee pong, so pull that good. This is a guy up on uh, Gibraltar Lake. He was a hunting guy. You can't see it, but uh, right behind the wing is another sandbar, and he had parked there. He was hunting, and he had the plane pointed towards us. And the wind came out of the west, which is not prevalent. Usually it's east wind, but the wind came out of the west. Got big enough waves that it wiped out his tail and got his, his boats dug under. He was, he was hunting with a guy, guiding his hunt. Anyway, the, the tails of the floats, they were 2960s, got sunk, kept going down, down, and the waves came and wiped out that tail. So he hired me to bring a new tail out of the mechanic. And the mechanic shows up and like, oh my God, we're going to fly this thing out. <laughs> sitting there for about two weeks. It's the same place. I'm over. Uh, I'm tied up to the sandbar, there's a sandbar that goes around. So he was lucky, he was able to pull it through the river and into this protected area here. That's the tail we brought out. Fortunately, he ended up ground looping about uh, six months later and then he sold the airplane to pieces. What, what river was that? That was a Gibraltar Lake. Gibraltar Lake, uh, Gibraltar River. It's just the first lake south of uh, Ileana Lake. Really great salmon run, great rafting. And then this is Dream Creek. Like on our side, Dream Creek and it's great uh, rainbow fishing. But it has some tremendous wind. So, you know, if you're there, check the clouds and make sure that you can get back out quick. I think this is one of the last ones. It's um, Tustamina. I just have never been down there. It's a really nice beach, good hunting. Everybody goes there in boats, but it's a nice trip on uh, wheels. trying to please two clients. I was working for a lodge, and the guy had me take them fishing. I'd never been fishing at Stony River Lodge, so I'm supposed to fish on the uh, Hovidna, the Ho-Ho, and uh, maybe the Tuscombe Willow, but anyway, this is the Hovidna. And I, he said, go fishing here. I said, well, what if that doesn't work? Don't worry, just go there. It's the only fish, basically, that he had. And so I was compelled to do it. This was about my third approach, and finally I decided, well, I think I can get in here. Nice day. Yeah, I had a really good friend in the back seat. His name was Steve also, and he, had a, he videoed everything I did. <laughs> and he sent me this. But I couldn't, I couldn't justify landing in any of these curves. There wasn't enough room. This is the 
know, make a solid spot. And that was about six inches deeper than the last time I did there. <laughs> yeah. I had a quarter-inch heel strip on my arrow sets, and it just on the right side it just ripped it. But it didn't leak. It didn't leak. <laughs> Famous last word. Wait, good, good pile of everyone. Yeah. So anyway, we had a great time there, fished, I reached underneath, you know, felt it, told the guys everything's fine. And then uh, how did I get out of there? I took them one at a time. I turned around in the deep pool up there and I flew them out this way one at a time. Up the river, I found a big long ice piece, put them on the beach, you know, one at a time, and then took them home. That's what she said. Yeah. So, <laughs> if, you, if you don't know if you can land up there, I mean, that's, you just got to take a chance. Don't ever, you know, try to salvage a bad situation like this. Let's see if I got a picture of the departure. So this is on the hoe or the ho ho? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to show. <laughs> what's the what's the long name? I think that's the holina hold and the ho ho lina. after I dropped them off and uh, put them together. Those are just two guys, but they were both very heavy. So how they take the, uh, hey, wait here, I'll swear I'll be back. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's all part of the adventure, which you have, especially on a day like this. There's great fishing here, I promise. I'll call the Hallsworth guys. I know them really well. And, uh, you know, 
what do you think about this place? How does it look? A Miramu landing. You know, I had to pick up somebody there. I've never been there. Oh, well, that's pretty tight. You, know, you probably should, should hire us to fly the Northern Wheel. Let me tell them. Okay, that's a good idea. But yeah, I have a different comfort level. You know, like you say, burn gas, go try it, come back, do it again. And, you know, and then I have a sat phone. And I have uh, my wife's dad has a 185. So that's my support network. <laughs> there also used to be a publication in Alaska 20, 25 years ago uh, that talked about you know the weather hazards where you go in all these different places. But how long was the phone numbers of people who were remote uh, bush property owners and, and such? And was, you know their radio phones, or whatever. There are different ways to get right. people to ask local stuff. Is there anything like that in the state anymore? I get that with the Bristol Bay guys. All the lodges they send out a thing every year, a laminated copy of their phone number or their HF frequency or. They're really good. Uh, somebody wrecked a beaver last year on Crosswind, I think it was last year. They forgot to put the flaps down, full load. I mean, they just destroyed that beaver across the beach, and it was gone literally within a week. So I mean, there's a lot of people out there know how to pick up airplanes and fix them. Okay. Any good thoughts or ideas on tying up when you're out in lakes like that? Um, you know, heel up on the beach and uh, this one here we have a, a pulley system. We have a rope that goes out and then it's anchored out and tied to the, to the toes, you know. And Piper's dad taught me a long time ago, is, you know, as long as it can swing around in the wind, it's fine. As long as there's enough rope to move around. You know, if you don't want to heel it up or if it's too rocky, you know, anchor it out as best you can. I always carry an anchor down and, and also they used to carry a, a bag, you know, Porous bag and fill it with rocks, you know, have a double anchor that way. 15, 20 knots is okay. If it gets more than that, then uh, you know, look for something, maybe find a, a different place to park and then walk back or whatever. <laughs> yeah. One, one thing I always do now is before I land, you know, figure out where to land, figure out where I'm going to take off, and figure out where, where, where you can park, where it looks like you can park, and then of course you got to find, find the fish. Alright guys, getting late, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Have you been to the lake on Montague? There's a Forest Service cabin. Yeah, I haven't been there, but it looks good. Just because uh, the one thing my uh, father in law told me was if there's lily pads, it's deep. There's yeah. a lot of lily pads on that lake. So yeah, it looks pretty safe. And uh, you know, it's going light the first time. Is, when you sink the floats, does anyone, uh, how do you get them floating again? I don't think you sink them all the way. Right, you just fill up the, uh, I fill up the middle compartments, yeah. mm -hmm. get enough weight in there, and then maybe the five gallon buckets. So when it's moving, it's either on the sand or it's just kind of barely twist, you know, it's like got so much ballast. Nice. And this was a Kodiak guy who had a 185. I don't know how it He swore by it. Kenny Peterson had his shell lake. He lived there year round, and he would have to sink his floats. Oh, cool. Wind would come up. But he was a uh, fairly shallow thing, so it's the rest of yeah. Is that a technique that's also employed sometimes by ocean seaplane pilots? Like that Kodiak guy, was he doing it in ocean or fresh water? I don't know. In the ocean, you got the tide. It's going to be all sorts of things. Yeah, out and back so much. Yeah. What kind of patch material do you like to carry for our bus floats? What kind of patch? Yeah, I mean, like anything. I've taken that, that plastic, two part plastic stuff, the putty, but I've really never needed anything. I used to, I carried that putty with my metal floats and that worked pretty well and I just have the putty as a leftover. I cracked one at uh, Shalatna one time up against those rocks, you know, I just didn't know it. It was kind of bouncing, pulled away, literally, you know, went to my buddy's cab and loaded up and took off and it was a little bit bad, but it didn't seem too bad and it got here and it had a big old crack. But anyway, if you get something like that, yeah, I think that, that, that two-part putty, you stick it on there and it stop it from leaking. Do you know a brand name of that putty that you're talking about? But, uh, it's a splash zone, but I think yeah. that's got it. That, that takes some time to kick. It's not five minutes. The splash zone is really good stuff. That's good to have fire at. Yeah. All right. My website is a sunlight aviation. I think. Needs a ride. Mix amongst yourselves and uh, thanks for being here.
Thank <laughs> you. 